Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at the California State University, Sacramento. This is um, my lecture on Peterson Chapter 3 in our Introduction to Decision Theory textbook. It's for my Inductive Logic 2 class, Phil 161. Um, so in Chapter 2, what we learned was that when you try to build a formal uh, quantified model of rationality, there's a number of tools we need. So we learned how to do decision matrices. We talked about splitting up um, agents between their different actions, different outcomes, different states of the world. And we talked about using different scales to measure the utility that we attach to uh, decisions in order to uh, insert those values into our into our models and then come up with answers to the question, what's the best decision? Okay, so today we're going to talk about primarily uh, making decisions under ignorance, and that's a technical term. It stands for something special, um, and we got to contrast that with decisions under risk. So uh, two things to talk about here. First off, um, one of the one of the basic principles we, we we're going to embody here, we're going to adopt, uh, not really with any argument for it, but just uh, lifting this basically from utilitarianism, is that utility is the term we're using to measure the value of the things we're after, the things we desire, the things we have goals for. And we're always going to try to act in order, uh, always act so to, as to maximize utility. That's just an axiom of rationality. Uh, to, to act in ways that minimize utility would be some kind of strange inverted utility monster. It would be some miserable life where you're trying, where you're seeking to make yourself as miserable as possible. So presumably, uh, the rational agent seeks to make themselves happy, make themselves acquire the things that they're after, whatever those might be. Now, we have other discussions about which are the most desirable goals to have, but the theory here is going to give us a model for um, once you know or once you've ascribed rankings or once you've decided uh, which things are more valuable than which and what values you attach to them, then which ones do you pursue? Okay, so we're going to treat that as one of the foundational axioms of rationality. Now, what it, what it means when we say we're making decisions under risk is it means that we, we've got a case, we've got a decision in front of us where we can ascribe some plausible account to the probabilities of the different outcomes happening, and then we know what those outcomes might be so we can time, assign utility to those outcomes. So in those cases, we use something that's known as expected value, the expected value theorem or the expected uh, value calculus. Um, the theorem is this big, complicated looking thing. And what it says is that the expected value for action A equals, so the left hand side of the equation says the expected value for action A equals, and the rest of that, what that amounts to is a weighted average of what? Well, there's different consequences. So imagine consequence one, consequence two, consequence, consequence three, all the way out to consequence n. So for an action, there might be any number of different consequences. There might be two, there might be 10, whatever. And for each one of those consequences, we split one of those out into, okay, so if I run a red light, one consequence is that I um, and now I, I'm, in a, I'm in a car wreck because I run a red light and somebody um, is going through the green on the other side and they hit my car. Okay, so that's a very um, bad consequence. It has a very, uh, very negative disutility, a very high disutility. So um, there's a probability attached to that. So given that, um, you know, it's 2 a.m. in the morning, um, and there's nobody around, the probability of my uh, having a wreck when I run the red light is pretty low because there's nobody around. The probability of my doing it at you know high noon and, or during rush hour is much higher. So for each of the possible outcomes, I run the red light, that's my choice, suppose, and I either am going to have a wreck or not have a wreck. So that's count consequence one and consequence two. We can assign a probability to each one of those and then a utility to both of those. So the utility of running the red light and not having the accident is that I get to I get home a little bit faster or I get to work a little bit faster when I'm late. Um, the the, disutil or the, the uh, utility of running the red light in the case where uh, I'm in a wreck 
is the is the rec. It's minus ten thousand or minus whatever, whatever sort of a negative utility you might attach to it. Maybe the repair is going to cost me three thousand dollars, right? So then, what I do is I multiply um, those two utilities by their probabilities, and I get a weighted average of what that action would produce for me in the long run, were I to do it over and over again. Um, that's what that theorem says, and I'll give you some examples and make some more sense of this and make it a bit more comfortable. So imagine I'm considering the uh, prospect of not getting a parking permit. So what's the expected value of tilde P, which means no permit? Well, it would be the probability of getting a ticket times the utility of getting a ticket plus the probability of no ticket times the utility of no ticket. So we can assign some numbers to these. Suppose that there's a 10% enforcement rate. Suppose that the that the uh, parking uh, permit um, uh, officer who patrols through the uh, through the parking lot catches 10% of the parking permit cheaters. So now we can and, and and suppose that a ticket costs $50. So now we can say that the expected value of not getting a permit means I run the risk of a 10% or 0.1 uh, chance of getting a $50 ticket, minus $50. Uh, that's that first conjunct, plus a 90% chance that I'll get nothing. Well, how, how do we get the zero there? Well, the zero is um, that I ran a 90% chance of not getting a ticket, and nothing happened to me. My wallet stayed the same. I didn't pay any money. I didn't lose any money. I didn't gain any money. Uh, I stayed at status quo. So now when you plug those numbers in and you run the numbers, we learn that the expected value of no parking permit on average runs to be about, runs to be minus $5. And what that means is that were I to do this same thing hundreds or thousands of times and were the enforcement rate 10%, about 10% of the time I would get a $50 ticket and 90% of the time I'd get no ticket. So on average, were I to average all of those cases, I would be paying about $5 per run, per time I do this. Uh, it's a kind of weighted average over time. Now, I, maybe I don't have to do it hundreds or thousands of times to get that result, um, but were I to uh, um, do a bunch of cases and were the parking uh, enforcement rate actually 10%, that's what it would cost me per uh, risky case. Uh, by contrast, then, suppose a permit costs seven fifty. So now we actually get an answer for what I should do. Um, not getting a permit runs, on average, a cost of, of $5. Now, what will happen is I'll get a $50 ticket, but were I to act in that way, in the big picture, in the long term, overall, that would average out to be about 5 bucks. So no permit, the expected value is 5 bucks, but a permit is seven fifty. So that doesn't make sense if, if money is my only goal here. Now, maybe being honest or, or paying my taxes or, or um, you know, the, the psychic distress of getting a ticket or the anxiety or something else, maybe those all add up too. But let's just treat it as if it's only about money. And if it's only about money, then it's cheaper for me to risk the ticket, given what expected value theorem says, than it is to just but to, to pay the, for the permit. So in this case, it says don't get a permit. Okay, so... Uh, the expected value theorem lets us uh, deal with cases where we know the probabilities and we know the utilities and we can plug in the values and we get answers to the expected value uh, of the action. And we can compare them and then we decide accordingly. Now, the cases we want to look at today are cases where um, you don't know the the probabilities. So we'll keep considering both of these and look back and forth and consider different principles and different ways to uh, analyze the cases. Okay, so the basics then of expected value theorem is, um, for instance, here's another example. Suppose you've got a uh, medical procedure. Let's call it medical procedure A. And suppose there's a 25% chance that you'll get a minus 40 utility out of it, or there's a 40% chance you'll get a plus 200 utility out of it, or a 35% chance you'll get a plus 80 utility out of it. Now, don't ask me how we got these numbers. I'm just making up a case. But imagine it's a, um, a medical procedure, and imagine that 25% of the population has a genetic um, um, profile such that one thing happens to them, other people this happens to them, other people that happens to them. Suppose we know the probabilities, and suppose we know we can assign values to those outcomes like a surgery or something. Now here's another surgery or another procedure. Imagine I compare procedure A with procedure B, 
And in procedure B, there's a 10% chance or 0.1 chance that you'll get a minus 75 utility, a 60% chance you'll get a 120 positive utility, or a 30% chance you'll get a 40 uh, positive utility. So the question is, which one should I do, given the, these sort of uncertainties? And you can see how expected value is really useful here, because it'll give us an answer to this, even though when you look at that, you can't sort of intuitively know which one it is. Can I tell just by looking? Um, that 200 is pretty good, but the probabilities are going to weight it. So the weighted average is not easy to just intuit. But when we run the numbers, um, and I actually do the math on it, the expected value of action A is 98. The expected value of action B is 76.5. So that says you should do A. A is the decision that um, on average in the long term that were you to act in this sort of fashion would produce the better outcome. Um, and you are always acting so that you're trying to maximize utility, so you should do A. It's as simple as that. And even if you do A, and suppose that the low probability bad event happens to you in procedure A case, um, suppose the 25% chance of minus 40 happens to you. So you happen to, you know, it's a bad roll of the dice, and you end up in that group that gets the minus 40 outcome. Would you have then made the wrong decision in that case? And expected value says, no, you didn't make the wrong decision. You knew that that was the risk going into it. And with the other decision, expected value B, I mean, for, for action B, procedure B, you were facing a possibility of a negative 75 outcome too. We don't know. You were rolling the dice uh, according to those probabilities. And sometimes you um, get unlucky. And sometimes you get the disutility. So even if you had gotten the bad outcome, it wouldn't have changed the rationality of the decision. The decision from the outset, according to the expected value theory, says there it is. You've got the numbers. Expected, I mean, uh, uh, procedure A is better than procedure B, even if you happen to be unlucky um, when you made that choice and you got one of the uh, low probability but bad outcomes happen to you. Okay, so here's another example just to put it in English and make it a little more sense of it. This is from a homework assignment from my Phil 61 class. Um, suppose there's a charity fundraiser celebrity base baseball game that's going to cost $13,000 to run the whole thing. And if the weather's clear, they're going to sell 500 tickets at $40 each. But if it rains, 30% chance, then they will only sell 100 tickets. Is it a good investment? That is, what's the expected value of hosting this game? All right, so we've got it. We're asking, what's the expected value of the fundraiser? And the, the probabilities are either 30% chance of rain or 70% chance of no rain. And in those two cases, different things happen. So what are those? Also interesting here is that there's a fixed cost. Uh, this fundraiser, the fundraiser costs $13,000 no matter whether it rains or it doesn't rain. So the equation then looks like this. The expected value of this fundraiser is going to cost us $13,000 plus a 70% chance at $20,000. What's that? Well, that's the 500 tickets at $40 each or a 30% chance at $4,000. What's that? That's the um, 100 tickets at $40 each. And that, when you run the math and you uh, figure it out, comes out to be $2,200. So the expected value of... Um, engaging in this action, holding the celebrity fundraiser, uh, puts you ahead by $2,200. Even though you spent $13,000, you stand on average to come out uh, $2,200. Um, more likely, since it's probably not going to rain, is that you'll make more than that. But on the whole, um, EXP says uh, this is a good, this is a positive action. You're not going to lose money on this choice. Okay, so now Let's consider the, the, the primary examples we're going to look at for Chapter 3. These are called decisions under ignorance. And, and these are cases where the decision maker knows what the alternatives are and what the outcomes could be, but can't assign probabilities to those outcomes. So since we don't have that multiplier, we can't use expected value to just figure it out the way we did in those previous cases. Okay, so a couple of points. Um, this concept of dominance, which we've talked about a little bit in the course so far, um, still applies. Um, so there's a complicated, there's a lot of things to say about dominance, and there's some complicated technical relationships between 
um, choices where one strictly dominates the other, or one weakly dominates, or one strongly dominates. And I'll talk about those in a second, but I just want to give the like really intuitive case first. Um, suppose the airline has delayed your flight and they're offering you a voucher. And your voucher is going to give you either a round trip flight to Boise, Idaho, or you can get a voucher that will give you a round trip flight to somewhere in Europe that will be determined by the airline. So you don't get to pick, just someplace in Europe. Okay, so you got a choice. Do you want A or do you want B? Um, and I, the way I designed it, and I think I may have gotten this from Peterson, or inspired from Peterson, is that, look, any place in Europe, the worst city in Europe, is better than uh, going to Boise. Sorry if you love Boise. So B, choice B, dominates, even though you can't assign probabilities to different locations in Europe. That is, B is the obvious choice. You should choose B because you'd rather go, you know, on vacation somewhere in Europe, any place in Europe, than go to Boise. So the idea of dominance here is that um, no matter what happened, no matter even the worst possible outcome for a choice is as good or better than the best thing the other one can offer. That's kind of roughly the idea of dominance. Although we got to tease out those different senses. Um, and the way Peterson does this is he talks about weak dominance versus strong dominance. And don't let the uh, technical uh, presentation here mess you up. Uh, the way to understand these terms are uh, this way. Um, look, I'm going to talk about the terms first, or talk about the symbols first. So this curved greater than relationship, like X is uh, the curve greater than, or B is curve smaller, uh, uh, less than C. What it means is that the way we use it, we use it in Peterson, is that X is more rational. It's a more rational act than Y. So go up to the top, weak dominance. Action AI is more rational or equally rational to action AJ if and only if this is true. Okay, so weak dominance means you've got two actions, I and J, and it says, look, I is at least as rational or more rational than J when this happens. Okay, and what is the this? Okay, the V stands for value. And what it says is the value of A, given the state of the world, is greater than or equal to the value of J, given the state of the world, for every possible state of the world. So what it says is, um, suppose I happens, and the full range, uh, the, all the possible states of the world unfold, and, suppose, and then contrast that to J's happening. And the weak dominance idea is that in every instance, no matter what happens with the state of the world in I, in, in the I cases, it's always at least as good or better than what happened in J. And this is like my uh, honors English example that I used in the last lecture. So this is actually a case that my son's facing. Um, he's considering whether to take AP English or regular English. And we're sort of framing the world as if the only two things that are going to happen is he's either going to get a B or he's going to get an A. Seems reasonable given how well he's doing in English this semester. So we can predict that he'll at least be able to get a B in um, AP English. He's worried about it because AP English is hard. Okay, well, it turns out that a um, AP English, what they do is they weight your GPA calculation more heavily. So it's like you're taking an extra unit, or it's like instead of getting a four at a, on a scale of one through two, three, four for, for A, B, C, D, you get a five for an A. So in AP English, you get a five for an A, or you get a four for a B. Well, it turns out in regular English, the very best you can do with an A is you get a four for your GPA, or if you get a B, then you just get a three. So in this case, actually, AP English um, actually strongly dominates um, uh, uh, English, uh, which I haven't talked about yet. So um, the idea is uh, that uh, AP English always does as well or better than English. And in the weak dominance case, the strange thing about the way Peterson defines it is, um, is this. Here, I can talk about it here. Um, weak dominance. Here it is in English. 
Weak dominance means something like this. An act is at least as rational or more so than another act if all its outcomes under every possible state of the world will be at least as good as that of the other alternative. So you could actually have two actions that are equivalent and you'd call them weakly dominant of each other, I guess. They could be the same by this definition. That's just to say they're always at least as good. Maybe they're equivalent. Um, but strong dominance means... Um, and you can kind of gloss it here in English, too. You can gloss this technical definition. It means something, actually, in English is pretty clear. Look, its outcomes under all the states must be at least as good as those of the other alternative. And in, 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 in at least one of the states, the outcome is better. So there has to be at least the opportunity to do better than the other action. So take, uh, for strong dominance, take I is more rational than J, if and only if the value of A um, for uh, every state of the world, m is greater than the value, greater than or equal to the greater of the value of j for every state m. And there's also, furthermore, some state n such that n is greater than uh, i, uh, action i is better than or produces more than the value of action j. Uh, so strong dominance, that technical definition captures that um, intuitive idea that comes out. Fairly clear in the English case. Okay, and I won't talk about the game theory example on the bottom right. We just keep it simple and just talk about the simple choice case. Um, so AP English strongly dominates English in this instance. Okay, so what about this case? Uh, when we don't know the probability distributions, how do we make the best decisions? And the point of that diversion to uh, talk about dominance was that even in cases where we don't know probabilities, we can recognize that there are dominant acts. So um, one of the other basic principles of rationality is never choose a strictly dominated action. Um, always, always choose the dominating action. You never want to opt for something that's dominated by some other choice. Um, so what principles should guide us when we're in the dark about the probabilities? Um, so in this case, in this example, imagine that you're going to a restaurant and you don't know which chef is working. Um, suppose there might be a good chef or there might be a bad chef, and you can't assign any probability to who's working. You don't know whether it's the good one or the bad one. And you figure that if the good chef is working, um, that good chef is really good at making fish. So that would be the best of all the possible things that could happen. You order the fish and the good chef is working. But if the bad chef is working, the fish is awful and that's the worst outcome. So that's the one. If either chef is working and you order a hamburger, a hamburger is a solid choice. Both of them do a decent job at it. At it. So that's a three for you. And uh, alternatively, you could just skip dinner and not invoke the risk. Uh, uh, so actually, this, this example is structured so that this forces you to choose. Um, I don't want to skip dinner because what's the uh, what you know what's going to happen to me if I skip dinner? Well, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to do well. That's my second best ranking. Um, it would be better at the very least to get a hamburger. That's at least third best. The worst thing to happen to me, worse than skipping dinner, would be to get the the fish from the bad chef. That's my lowest ranking choice. So when you look at the matrix, you realize actually there's something that, that comes out here um, that becomes clearer. We need a principled way to decide under ignorance. There must be a way that I can make a choice here to figure out what to do. Okay, so here's our first example of a principle that will let us uh, figure this out without knowing the probabilities. And it's called the maxi min principle. We might focus on the worst possible outcomes of each alternative. You might look at all the cases and go, well, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? And then just use those as my metric for deciding what to do. So the maximin rule, a little more formally says, maximize the minimal value obtainable with each act. If the worst possible outcome for one alter alternative is better than that of another, then choose the former when I don't know the probabilities. So maximin says, um, look at all the possible worst outcomes, and then choose the one that has the least worst, the best worst thing that comes out of all the possible outcomes. So like, look at this case. Um, what are the worst possible outcomes for actions A1 through A4? So you've got choices of what to do along the, the left-hand column, and you've got states of the world, state 1 through 4, that unfold across the top row. 
Um, well, let's look at each one in turn. Uh, for A1, what's the worst that can happen to me? Uh, the worst that can happen to me is state four. That's like um, the bad chef cooking sh cooking fish, and that's a zero. If uh, if a if I choose a two, what's the worst that happens to me? It's a minus five. That's bad. If I choose a three, what happens? It's a two. And if I choose a four, what happens? It's a minus eight. So now I've got circled all the possible worst things that can happen under all four of these options. And now the max and min rule says pick the least bad of all of those. Pick the best worst of all those. And the best worst of all of those is action A3. Because at the worst, the worst thing that can happen to me with A3 is that I get two on my scale, whereas the worst that can happen to the others is all worse than that. So the best worst, or the maxi min in this case, is A3. Um, and the maxi min rule says um, action I is more rational or equally rational to J if and only if um, the, the minimum of action I is greater, uh, more rational or equal to the minimum of uh, action AJ, which is intuitive and fits with sort of the idea we've got in our heads. Okay, so and the th same thing hap actually happens, uh, goes for um, the hamburger case. I, I think I've got it again here in the uh, in the slides, but you'll see in a second. So what about this case? Where should you open the next branch of your business? So the maxi min rule says, well, look at all of the options. Um, suppose I'm considering Marrakesh, Toronto, or San Diego, and I'm considering three different states of the world that unfold. The market goes well, the market goes medium, the market goes poorly. So in those three cases, what are the worst outcomes? There are 6,000 in Marrakesh, 2,000 in Toronto, or 3,000 in San Diego. So the best worst of all of those is Marrakesh. Notice, however, that um, the best best of all the possible things that could happen is San Diego and the market goes well. Like I stand to make a lot of money in San Diego if the market goes well, but I won't do as well if things go poorly if I go to San Diego. So we're not measuring the best, we're measuring the worst. So Marrakesh is the best choice according to the maxi min principle. Um, okay, so now again, contrast to known risk cases, like the expected value cases we considered. Um, in those cases, you know the probabilities, so we plug those values in, we know the utilities, and we can compare, but we're worried about cases where we don't know the probabilities. So we've got these um, question marks in place for, well, what's the probability? For all I know, um, action C might be a lot better than action A and B, depending on how those probabilities get distributed. Because look, the second choice or the second outcome for action C is a 230, which is really high. So now if there's a high probability for, of getting that second outcome under C, then that's great. But I don't know what it is, so I can't assign a number here and I can't proceed. Without the probabilities, we don't know how much to weigh the positives and the negatives. The proportional impact of the negative outcome could, for all we know, swamp the positives or be minimized because it's highly improbable. Like lightning strikes, the downsides are huge, but the probability is very small, so we discount them in our decisions. Okay, so again, uh, like a parking permit case, suppose a permit costs $6 and the odds of getting a $52 ticket are 10%, or suppose that the odds are 60%. We can plug in the values and we can see that um, if enforcement rates are 10%, then it's cheaper to cheat and not get the permit. But if enforcement rates are 60%, then it's a lot more expensive to cheat. It's better to just get a permit. And if the police know what they're doing, they're going to assign, um, they're going to patrol, and they're going to assign values to tickets that make this um, calculus work so that you buy permits, presumably. Um, okay, so actually, there's our, there's our example. So our maximum principle says, uh, choose I over J, if and only if the worst of I is greater than or equal to the worst of J. Um, and that means that in the restaurant case, which one of these choices, um, fish, hamburger, or skip dinner, um, is better or worse? Well, under fish, the worst that can happen to me is one. Under hamburger, the worst that can happen to me is three. And under skipping dinner, the worst that can happen to me is two. So that means Maxi Min predicts that I should choose the hamburger, where I'm trying to minimize um, the worst things. Hamburger is the best worst choice. 
If the worst of two or more are the same, the principle says you've got to be indifferent about them. So um, that's true for skipping dinner, they're equivalent, and hamburgers, they're equivalent in this case. Now, what about um, choices A, one through four? Actually, this is the same as the example we looked at just before. Um, uh, and we, we ran through the, uh, the cases there. Uh, what it does is uh, tells us that um, the best option in these cases is A3. Okay, so that's an example of a principle that would let us decide in cases where we don't know the probabilities, what if anything is wrong with adopting this approach? Well, one thing you might say about it is that it focuses on the worst. It focuses on the bad outcomes. It only thinks about the negatives. And we might want to figure out a way to navigate decisions uh, so that we can incorporate or fold in some of the considerations about the positives, because those might count for something in a decision like this. So there's a, um, a revision um, to this principle that's known as the Lexi-Min rule that says this, and it actually makes a lot of sense. And imagine you've got a lottery case where um, you're going to choose either A1 or A2, and if state one of the world happens, you'll get a dollar, if state one happens, you'll get a dollar in the other case. But if state two happens, you get $10,000. Uh, but if you choose A2 and state two happens, uh, you'll get $10. Okay, so on the maxi-min uh, maxi principle, it would say, well, uh, compare them and choose the best worst of the two. Well, it turns out the worst of actions A1 and A2 are the same. Uh, the worst that can happen to you is that you get a dollar. Um, but uh, MaxiMin doesn't allow us to look at or get to that $10,000 in the upper right-hand corner. So the lexical MaxiMin actually is a revision on that principle that lets us um, fold that in and get a consideration. If the worst outcome of the two or more acts are equally good, the MaxiMin rule tells you to be indifferent. So if A will produce $1 or $2 and B will produce $1 or $10,000, you should be indifferent on the first principle. But Leximan says, if the worst outcomes of two acts are equal, choose the alternative in which the second worst outcome is as good as possible, or the third, and so on. And there it is more formalized, but the idea is, if they're equivalent, then you go to the next bad outcome, and you compare those. And if those are equivalent, you go to the next bad outcome, and you compare those, and you figure out which one is superior, which one's going to produce more, which one's going to pay off better in the bigger term. So the lexical maximin rule, or leximin as it's sometimes called, um, gives us a way to, to um, take a sort, of, sort of incorporate some of that, the possibility of getting some of those bonuses out of there. Okay, so in general, what's going on here, and this is like a more a rationale for why would we adopt either one of these principles. Look, for decisions under uncertainty, maximin and leximin allow you to transform it into a sort of decision under certainty. Like you've got a principle now. Here's a case where you don't know what's going to happen, but you know what you want to have, you know what you like, so you can now use a principled, like organized, um, uh, rational principle to apply to the case and make choices. Um, you don't know the probabilities, but you know what the worst outcomes are, so now you've got an answer. You're not just throwing, da uh, throwing darts, you're not just guessing, um, you're not just hoping for the worst and crossing your fingers, but you're doing something that makes some sense, and it's a policy that you could defend. You could say, look, my policy is, when I don't know um, what the possible outcomes are, my policy is to look at all the possible bad things that happen, and then I, I try to minimize those, so I pick the best worst of all of those. Like, that's, that seems like it's defensible if you really don't know anything else about what's going on. You've got a structured, reasonable, utility, utility maximizing uh, way to produce, to proceed with the information you've got. So it seems like it makes some uh, sense over just getting distracted by the jackpots or getting distracted by the good outcomes because you don't know how likely those might be. Um, if the worst possible outcome should guide one's decisions, then maybe generally the, the maximin or leximin rules let you decide without fearing or having regret about the outcomes. You could decide and go, hey, I made the right choice given my circumstances. All right, so um, we might ask, and this is sort of alluding to what's going to come next in the next lecture, why will we give the worst outcomes so much weight? I mean, why not think about the best? Uh, why not look at the jackpots? You know, those would be would be beneficial, right? What if we single out the best possible outcome as the criteria for decisions under uncertainty? 
Um, and that might lead us to something, you know, uh, Peterson calls it the maxi max rule. Like I want to maximize my maximum. I want to get the most I can get out of everything. One should maximize the maximal value obtainable with an act. And Peterson says nobody endorses this rule um, because it's too, I don't know, there's something sort of unnerving about it. It's a bit like a lottery. Um, <clears throat> you know, what happens with people when they're buying lottery tickets, which is not a decision under uh, ignorance case, by the way. Because with lottery tickets, we know what the probabilities are. Um, the probability of you winning the lottery is astronomically low. Uh, but that, that great big jackpot looms large in people's imaginations, and they get sort of distracted by what would it be like if I was a multimillionaire, and they end up spending all this money on lottery tickets that they've got, you know, up, you know, hardly any chance of winning. In fact, when you plug those into the expected value theorem, you get the answer that this thing costs you more and the odds are just, it's, it's it has um, a very poor expected value. Uh, lottery tickets do. Um, so there's something about the maxi max rule that um, Peterson doesn't say much else about it, but it seems like we shouldn't just be steered by, um, you know, the, 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 the shiny, J jangly jackpots, like the things that just distract us, or the things, you know, these, these pie-in-the-sky ideals. Um, we ought to take some accounting of the bad outcomes that can happen. You can imagine some cases that would spill, spin those out. Um, in previous cases, fear steers the decisions because we're trying to avoid the worst outcomes. Here, in a maxi-max rule, reward steers the decisions. So that could produce some uh, different answers. Um, maybe this is better. And what Peterson is going to talk about next, and I'm actually not going to do it in this lecture, but he has an optimism-pessimism rule. Consider both best and worst for each alternative. Factor in your optimism, your pessimism, and then choose the best. So, so what Peterson is trying to do is come up with a kind of hybrid that allows us to put some weight on the positives, some weight on the negatives, and then um, sculpt your decision accordingly. The thing is, um, in decisions under ignorance, uh, we don't have the probability weightings, so we don't know how to proportion um, those uh, weighted averages. So we'll come back to that in a second, or at least in the next lecture. Okay, so now uh, let me just call out some hazards here. Um, with the expected value calculations and all these other cases, that's our gold standard here. That's the one that we use in cases where we know the probabilities. But we don't know them here. So here we are. We know that we're prone to distort the probabilities when we do know them, um, and we're also bad at predicting utilities. Okay, so let me talk about both. Um, sort of a related worries. So there's the expected value theory, and what I mean is, um, and this lecture is from. Um, oh, geez, I can't remember his name now. It's Dan. Oh, I can't remember his last name. He's a famous psychologist at Harvard. Wrote this book. Um, about happiness. It's an excellent book. A Stumbling on Happiness. Gilbert, I think, is his name. Stumbling on Happiness is an excellent book, and it's very good about summarizing some of this research, and that's the TED Talk, which I also really encourage you to watch. Um, and, and what he does there, Gilbert does, is he explains, humans are consistently and predictably bad at, one, estimating probabilities accurately, we, we do poorly at that, and I'll talk about that in a second. And we also do poorly at estimating the consequences. We can't estimate regret, pleasure, utility. Um, we're very bad affective forecasters, is what Gilbert d explains in his book. And when you understand that about yourself, you can actually make much better quality decisions. Okay, so we're bad at um, decisions under, uh, under uncertainty, because in part because we're prone to distort probabilities even when we know them. And this is a famous um, graph from Kahneman Tversky that shows the uh, distortions that we put on um, probabilities when we uh, are, are up against choices. What happens is if the chance of something happening is really small, we weight it higher. That's what that small bump on the curve means on the S curve on the left. Uh, we inflate small probabilities. That's people who are making, who are buying lottery tickets. They, they maybe have some nominal awareness of the probability being low, but they inflate that because they're hopeful. 
Um, and if the chance of something's happening is very high, we actually treat it like it's lower. We deflate it. Um, we reduce it, and that's that other curve on the other side. And I talk about this at great length in my Phil 61 class. Um, it also is true that mere repetition leads people to increase their estimation of probabilities. Um, we're bad at estimating probabilities. And then there's all these other biases that we have, affect heuristic, recency effect, availability bias, and so on. They lead us to skew probability estimates. So just a warning about um, this chapter and following chapters is that when we do try to uh, estimate probabilities, uh, we often uh, inflate them or deflate them in predictable and known ways. Okay, so, so far here's where we are. Um, the sort of axiom of rationality is that you should act Always act so that you maximize utility. Um, to do otherwise is bizarre. It's pathological. It's it's that's that's the that's the uh, um, the perfect example, the consummate example of irrationality. To act against your own interest, to act in ways that makes you worse off. That would be uh, perfectly irrational. Uh, dominance. Uh, is this concept we've talked about weak dominance and strong dominance now and the general principle here is that you never should choose a dominated option um, in cases where we're making decisions under risk with known probabilities we're going to use the expected value theorem and we'll have lots more opportunities to do that later and in cases where we're making decisions under ignorance the uh, maxi min rule says to minimize the worst outcomes and you identify which uh, which option will give you that, and then that's the best choice. Or the Lexi-Min lets you do tiebreakers or lets you go to the next worst and think about that. Um, and furthermore, I've, I've suggested and hinted at some of the research that says, look, we're also warning we're very bad at estimating probabilities. We inflate low probabilities and we deflate high probabilities. Uh, we're bad affective forecasters. All right. So that's my first discussion uh, about Peterson's chapter three, and we'll continue, continue with some of the more technical uh, problems and ideas and questions next time.